fantastic. All right, so we're going to put her name to the side. Uh, let me pull a teacher's card out. Anybody want to? Huh? Hey, look, the Holy Spirit led. Let's hear a drum roll. Roland Bradford. Where's Roland? Come on down. All right, now Debbie's going to have, you got more people back there? So if you're in here and you did not fill out a card, just follow Debbie and she'll help you get squared away because we're going to be giving more books out. So we are going in the order of the stack, Roland, and I want to just say a little bit about this book you're getting. It's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. It's co-written by guys named Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Out of curiosity, anybody heard of this book? Yeah, it's a pretty prominent, very popular book. It has a companion volume that we'll be giving away later on. But this book here basically gives you some essentials and basics on interpreting the Bible. So there you are. You are uh, the proud owner of the, how to read the Bible for all it's worth. All right. Bye. Thank you very much. Oh, and by the way, I am trusting that if you're a winner and you accept the book, that you will cherish it, that you will not throw it in your car trunk and leave it there, that you will soak it up. And so uh, I'm hoping that this will be a good opportunity for all of us to kind of resource ourselves. Okay, that's our first round of giveaways. We got three more throughout the night. Let me tell you a little bit about how uh, I want tonight to feel how I want it to go. Um, I am aiming for a calm atmosphere, relaxed atmosphere. I want us just to take a deep breath. I want us to soak it in so we're not in a rush. This is not a sermon. Uh, we, we just kind of want to sit. And if, you're, if your life is hectic like mine, I want you actually to just take advantage of the fact that you're, hey, we're sitting still. We're taking a few deep breaths together. We're going to spend time going through lots of scriptures. So I'll just warn you, either get really nimble Bible fingers or just be ready to sit there and listen because we're going to cover several, several verses tonight. Also, I want you to know, uh, this is so relaxed. Feel free to come and go as you need to. If you need to go use the restroom, go use the restroom. If you need to leave, we got other ministries taking place uh, uh, later on, feel free to go when you need to go. That's no problem. Lord willing, we will have all of these recorded. So uh, if you can't make it to all of it and you wanted to kind of finish it, you can down, down the road we'll have those ready to go. If uh, you're interested in coming to multiple lectures but you can't make next week for whatever reason, we're planning on having them recorded. So we just want this to be kind of a relaxed atmosphere uh, and something we can really enjoy. I want to tell you why these are called Ember Lectures. Uh, if you were at the business meeting a few weeks ago, you heard me share a little bit about this. But the phrase Ember Lectures is actually something that I kind of have turned over and churned on. It's intentional, uh, gone back and forth. But let me, let me tell you why each word is in the phrase. I want you to think about embers. I, I got up here about three weeks ago and told everybody everything I hated about camping. There's one thing I like about camping. It's the campfire. And I think about embers. I think that when you have a campfire that's been roaring and it finally starts to burn down, and it's at that point where it's just the embers are glowing, kind of snapping a little bit, that is some of the best conversation atmosphere there is. Some, some of the best conversations that are had are around a campfire that is just burning down because usually what has happened is, uh, let's say it was a party around a bonfire or something, but as the embers are still glowing, most of the people are gone. They've gone off to their schedules, but you may have just a handful of folks who, who maybe are really close friends, and they've already gotten all the small talk out of the way, and now they're just sitting around the embers, and they're just enjoying time. One of the most significant conversations I had one time was just as, as me and one other person just sat. Everyone else had started going away, and there's just these embers going, and we just basically stared. I'm one of those that can just stare at a fire and then poke it every once in a while. And we just sat there and talked and talked for, I don't know, maybe two hours or so. So there's this intimacy. So that's part of it is I want us to feel like, you know what, we're just, this is not the hustle bustle of Sunday morning. Uh, this is not a full-fledged worship service. We're just kind of slowing down and we're going to sit around some embers and we're going to soak it in together. Now let me tell you about why I'm using the word lectures. 
it's because that I know that there's not a more exciting word than lecture. No, actually, I wrestled with this. I actually know that the word lecture is not necessarily all that exciting to many people. But I also know there are a few people that love the word lecture. Raise your hand if the word lecture actually is appealing to you. I saw two, three, four. There's a few of us out there. But this is intentional. This is really what we're going for. Is I do want us to have this time where we really are just focused. And, and this word captures it. I want us to be focused. I want us to be bookish. Um, I don't want us to be boring or dry. But, but there's this sense where we're just going to hone in. And so this is why we are calling these uh, the Ember Lectures. It just kind of had a ring to it and I stuck with it. And so that's why, uh, that's why they're called this. Let me give you a survey of, of what's coming up. So tonight we're going to have our first lecture, and the title of it is The Bible, God's Word. So we're going to talk about the nature of the Bible tonight. And uh, I, I see a hand. It, it, okay, I'm a little too loud. I think someone can hear me who can fix that. I wondered if I'm a little too loud. So if someone can hear me, they could, uh, I don't know if they can hear me in the room or not, but I'll try not to just yell too. Watch this. Is that a little better? Can you hear me? No. They said I'm a little loud. Is that a little better? All right, that might be a happy medium right there, Betsy. All right, thank you. Uh, so tonight we're looking at the Bible, God's Word. Let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about what the uh, next three lectures are going to be. The second one next week is going to be about interpreting the Bible. We're going to talk a little bit more about how do we just really uh, interpret it, soak it in, study it up. Uh, the third week we're going to talk about teaching the Bible. And then the fourth week uh, we're going to talk about the Bible as a whole and as its parts. So more about really kind of wrapping back around to the idea of the nature of the Bible, the composition of the Bible, and so on and so forth. And, and as a reminder, before we pray, we are all guinea pigs. So I cannot emphasize that enough. Let's have fun with this, and let's see what God wants to do through it. So with that being said, let me pray, and we will get started. Also, if you didn't grab an outline, everybody grab an outline on their way in. We do have a simple outline that you can fill in blanks and so on and so forth. Uh, and I trust many of you brought notepads and stuff like that. So let's pray. So God, I thank you uh, that we can take some time and just sort of uh, take a deep breath together around your word. And God, I do ask that in so many ways, uh, what we experience is like sitting around a campfire that is giving us light and warmth and is drawing community together and fostering uh, not just small talk but but deeper conversation even if it's just deeper thought and so the Lord use this for those purposes and and just bless this time we thank you for the Bible and we we do know that this is a gift you've given to us and we also confess together that uh, we haven't always cherished it like we should we never really will we need you to be gracious to us because you have revealed yourself to us through your word. And so we want to do what we can as a church to uh, just fan into flame a passion that we have for your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One other thing about embers that I think is powerful, and I hope this is what we'll see over time, is that you can take embers from one fire and you can travel a certain distance, and you can use those embers to start another fire. And so there is also this idea of multiplication, and so all of that is wrapped up into the idea of embers. So let me ask a, a hypothetical question. I want you to imagine that you have had some friends over for dinner, and, uh, and you've had good company, good dinner with them, had a great meal, and you've finished your dessert. I recommend pecan pie with ice cream. And just so you know, pecan is the correct way to say that. So you've had pecan pie with ice cream, and you've got a cup of coffee in your hand, and you're sitting down with your friends. And I want you to just imagine hypothetically, what if your friend asked you this? Who wrote the Bible? 
That's not a typical conversation starter. That's not small talk. Who wrote the Bible? Now, just without a loud answer, just think, what would you say? If someone just said, who wrote the Bible? Maybe you realize that's actually a pretty thick question. And there's some complexity to it, which is a good thing, by the way. It's not just a quick, easy answer. It's a robust answer in reality. Who wrote the Bible? So one of the first things I want to talk about is the authors of God's Word. Now, before you start writing in your first blank, let me tell you how I've spelled this out in my outline. I've spelled it out author, and then in parenthesis put an S. Okay, so it's authors, but the S is in a parenthesis. I want us to talk about the authors of God's Word. Now, first what I want to do is I want to realize that there are human authors that were used to develop the Scriptures. So what we're going to do is take a smattering of these. This is just a sample. We could be here virtually all night doing this, uh, but I want us to take some. And what I'm going to ask you to do is come along with me in your Bible to as many of these places as you can. So let's find Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1. Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. It's right after Ezra. Again, as always, if you need to use your table of contents, do it. I still use my table of contents in my Bible from time to time. So go ahead and let's find Nehemiah chapter 1. And I'm going to read the very first sentence. All right, here's how the book of Nehemiah starts. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. As a sidebar, do you know how to read Old Testament names that you don't know how to pronounce? Just read them with confidence. <laughs> The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. I just want us to see, I want us to slow down around the embers, so to speak, enough to look at one sentence and to see that these are the words of a man, a specific man named Nehemiah. Now let's also look at several of these in the Psalms. Find Psalms chapter 3. We're going to look at a bunch of these. You, I think you have them all listed on your outline in, in reference form. Psalm chapter 3. Now, in, in your copy of the Bible, you probably have it looking like a caption. You notice these captions over certain psalms in Psalm chapter 3? The caption says, a psalm of who? David. David. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Just so you know, this is not... This is not like a, a title caption that the publishers, that the, in our case, I'm using the ESV, this is not a caption that the publishers put in there. This is in the Hebrew text. Okay, the, a psalm of David. Let's, let's find a couple more examples. Let's turn to Psalm 72. Find Psalm 72. We're going to look at the caption there. It says of whom? Of Solomon, okay? So we have a psalm of David. We have a psalm of Solomon. Look at the very next psalm, chapter 73, a psalm of Asaph. One more, let's find Psalm 85. All right, this one has an interesting detail to the choir master. A psalm of the sons of Korah. So now we have multiple authors, so to speak. This song that I guess was written by these sons of Korah. So now we've seen David, Solomon, Asaph, the sons of Korah. Uh, you may all have already known that some of the psalms are identified like this, but we're being told about authors, lyricists, writers who are involved in the creation of, of the books of the Bible. Let's go to Proverbs, Proverbs 1. All right, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. 
the Proverbs of who? Solomon. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Go to chapter 10. I told you we're going to be finding a lot of verses. And I'm doing this with you, by the way. I'm not cheating. Even though I have a lot of these written down, I'm coming with you in the Bible here. Proverbs 10, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. Okay, reminding us there's, there's a source to this. Let's go to chapter 25. Okay, chapter 25, verse 1. This is a little bit different. These are also, these also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So there's this layer to it. These are Proverbs attributed to Solomon, but they were copied, written down by the men of Hezekiah, who was the king of Judah. Go to uh, chapter 30. We'll do two more in the Proverbs. In chapter 30, verse 1. These are the words of, how would you say that? Excellent, sounded perfect. Agur, I guess, son of Jacob. All right, the words of Agur, Agur, son of Jacob. Chapter 31, verse 1. The words of King Lemuel. And on top of that, look at this, an oracle that his mother taught him. So talk about adding some some richness to these documents, these Proverbs. These are the words of a king, but they're the words that his mother taught him. All right, go to Ecclesiastes. It's just the next page. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. These are the words of the who? The preacher. The words of the preacher. I like that. The son of David. King of Jerusalem, Solomon. So now we know that the book of Ecclesiastes has this preacher as its author. Note that throughout the book, it's written in first person until you get to chapter 12. Go ahead and look to chapter 12 real quick with me. Just sort of uh, an FYI here in chapter 12, verse 9. I want to read verses 9 and 10 to you. This is how it begins to, to wind up this book, Ecclesiastes. In chapter 12, verse 9, being, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. Again, just elaborating on how this preacher was involved with writing things out, studying things, thinking things through, and teaching others. Uh, let's go to the book of Isaiah. Just keep flipping forward a little bit. You'll find Isaiah. In chapter 1, verse 1. And this kind of gives us an example of uh, really several other uh, the prophetic books begin in similar ways. Isaiah 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So he saw things, he saw vision, and he wrote them down, spoke them, and then they were written down somehow, so on and so forth. Uh, these are the words of Isaiah. Okay, so those are all examples of, New, of Old Testament documents showing in some form or fashion, their human author source. Now let's look at some New Testament examples. Uh, one of the more famous ones is Luke. Go to the beginning of Luke. I love how the book of Luke starts. Luke chapter 1, and I want to read to you verses 1 through 4. I want you to marvel at how, how the book of Luke came about, what, what Luke is up to, what we learn about his uh, his. His intention, what we learn about even his personality in a way. So Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now just, let's take a moment right here and just think about this. Did you, do you see 
Do you see how, how, how rich this is, what Luke just said? I'm going to read through it again. I want you to just try to soak in his personality, soak in what we're learning about his process and, and how things came about and how the, the word of mouth spread and eventually things about Jesus were written down. In as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. So he's acknowledging that many have done this. Many have tried to compile and organize and narrate this narrative of the things that have been accomplished, namely that Jesus has accomplished. And, and so Luke's saying, you know what, a lot of people have tried this. I'm going to throw my hat in the boat too. I'm going to try this as well. And as much as many have tried to compile a narrative of all that's been accomplished, then he goes on further, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So he's acknowledging that there are people who, as we saw this morning with Peter, eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and ministry, those eyewitnesses, not just the closest disciples, but all of the people, Imagine how many people experienced Jesus' ministry. Just a few weeks ago, we looked at how John, in the Gospel of John, he says, you know what, if everything was written down that Jesus did, if everything was written about, he says, I suppose the world wouldn't even be big enough to contain it all. And you may remember, I actually ended up arguing that I don't think he's being facetious. I really don't. I really started thinking, if, if really the significance of every divine moment, which for Jesus was every moment. Every moment, every interaction was a moment between God and a human. If every one of those moments was written out and all of its significance was elaborated on, you may not be able to hold it all. And, and still, there are these attempts. People are trying to put all this together. Now, let's go here what they have to say, and let's, let's go hear what these people have to say, and let's try to figure out this, and let's try to remember how this played out and all that. I'm just, I'm just speculating here. All of these attempts to compile a narrative, as eyewitnesses had delivered them, in verse 3, Luke says, well, it seemed good to me also. And then we learn about Luke a little bit, that he followed all things closely for some time past, this was not haphazard. This was not shooting from the hip. He was following all things closely for some time past. He wanted to write an orderly account. And he has a recipient, most excellent Theophilus. That, that name means friend of God. And he gives the reason why in verse 4. Why did he do this? So that Theophilus may have certainty concerning the things that he had been taught. That's one of the things that we need more of is certainty about what the Scriptures have to say. And so I really value not only what Luke did and how he went about doing it, but I value why and the fact that he tells his reader why. Like, this is such a valuable introduction here. Also, look in Acts Many of you know Luke and Acts are kind of like a two-part series that Luke wrote. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. He's just basically picking up where he left off. This is essentially a sequel to the gospel according to Luke. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, so on and so forth. So he acknowledges, you know what, I've written one book to you. So now here we go, another one, and he essentially picks up where he left off. And then he, he starts to say, you know what, I've, I've shown you the life and ministry of Jesus through his ascension, and now we're going to see the church explode onto the scene by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Luke is explaining why he's writing uh, what he did. Go to the book of John, John chapter 5. This is a verse sort of tucked away. Uh, he might not necessarily read it and, and think about it in terms of this conversation tonight, but I want you to see John chapter 5, verse 46. In one of uh, Jesus' many uh, controversial conversations with folks, he says in John chapter 5, verse 46, where he's being opposed, and so he's in this 
in the thick of controversy, so to speak. He says, John 5, 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. But then he goes on to explain why. Why? For Moses wrote of me. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. Now, there are, <laughs> there are oceans of significance in this statement, and I think we'll get to that more over the next three weeks. But right now, I'm just pointing out that Jesus says, look, Moses wrote. That's what we're just looking at right now. Moses wrote something. There are human authors. Go to Romans 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to do a few more of these, and then we're going to change gears Romans chapter 1, verse 1. All right, look at how the book of Romans begins. The letter to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The very first word is identifying the author. He's writing a letter. He wants them to know who it's from. Paul, this is who it's from. Now, go to the very end of the book. Chapter 16, verse 22. This is something that's interesting, just for us to be aware of. In chapter 16, verse 22, look what it says. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. So Paul's using some help here, right? Uh, There's a word, emanuensis, someone who could help write something. If you dictate something to somebody and they're they're writing it down, a stenographer. That's basically what's going on here. So there's sort of another layer to how this Letter was written on the very next page, 1 Corinthians 1. Here again, we see verse 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. So it's like now we got to, Paul gets all the credit, probably rightly so, but there's a bit of a co-authorship here. Somehow Sosthenes has a role to play in this letter to the Corinthians. Now go to the very end of 1 Corinthians, chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse... 21 says this, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. So best we can tell, sometimes Paul would dictate something, but he would make a point to write out the closing. He wants them to know, this is, this is me. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Okay, we're going to come back to that idea in just a moment, so kind of hang on to that. Let's look at James chapter 1. We're just going to keep moving forward here. James chapter 1, verse 1. Again, the first word is identifying the person who's written this letter. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then one more example. We're going to finish in the book of Revelation, which is just fascinating. Seeing how this human author, what kind of role that this human author named John played in the writing of the book of Revelation. So in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, we're actually going to read several verses in this. So kind of follow along with me. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. And then verse 4 begins by saying, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. So he begins to address these churches. I want you to skip down to verse 9 with me. Let's read verses 9 through 11. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. 
Isn't it fascinating that this is how the book of Revelation came into being? That John is, is being persecuted. He's in isolation on an island. And he is told to write in a book. He Write a book. Be an author of what you are going to see. This is sort of the first main cog that I want you and I to kind of put in our mindset is the fact that human authors wrote Scripture. It's important. This, this is very, very important. And in fascinating ways, you see in different ways. Some were songs, some were letters, some, some are these revelations that probably, in John's case, even boggled his mind. And he just has this extraordinary experience where he's He's visited with this angelic vision and Jesus himself appears and he writes all this stuff down. Or you have a king that just learned something from a mom. It almost sounds like maybe it was like a, I don't know, a bedtime story or something that, that he just learned. And, and now we find it in the book of Proverbs and you have a historian type mentality in Luke who's like, you know what? I need to get in on this. I need to make sure there's an orderly account written of the things that have taken place before people mess it up or it gets forgotten or whatever. He's, he's so orderly and he's intentional. There's all these different personalities and they were all used to write Scripture. But they were not the only ones involved. So I want us to know and I want us to celebrate that not only were there human authors, and we only looked at some of them, by the way, we could have looked at all of them. I didn't know if that would go over real well. But there is a divine author to Scripture. Absolutely bedrock conviction that we have to have. There is a divine author. It wasn't just men writing. It was, it was God writing this book. I want us to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, when it comes to uh, preachers... 2 Timothy chapter 3 is just one of those special passages. We're actually going to look at it a couple different times tonight. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is writing to a young pastor by the name of Timothy, a protege, so to speak. And so he's given him all sorts of advice on how to pastor. The books, by the way, First and 2 Timothy and Titus have a bit of a nickname. Does anybody know what they are? Yeah, the pastoral epistles, the pastoral letters, they're written to kind of give pastors insight on how to lead. So he's writing this young pastor. And all I want to do is look at just one statement for right now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the very first part of it. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. In other words, all of the writings, the word is graphe, it's this very important word, all of the graphe, the writings, they are breathed out by God. They are inspired. When we say that the Bible is inspired, we get it mainly from this text. It's this idea that God breathed it out. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All the sacred writings of verse 15. Just hop up to verse 15 and look at this. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. It's the sacred writings that are being referred to as Scripture in verse 16. And this essentially, when Paul writes this to Timothy, what's he referring to? Yeah, the Old Testament. He's ref now, he, he wouldn't have called it the Old Testament. It's the Scripture. It's the writings, the sacred writings. They weren't necessarily all bound up in one nice book with the leather binding and all that, right? They were just writings, and, and, and they had been used over centuries for powerful ways for the people of God. But this is what we refer to as the Old Testament. And he's telling Timothy, they were all breathed out by God. So even though King Lemuel uh, had Proverbs written down, even though Solomon wrote as the preacher of the book of Ecclesiastes, even though David's psalms are written down, even though Moses wrote, even though Nehemiah spoke prophecy and all this, we're also being told that God breathed them out. 
Let's go to 2 Peter 1.21. If you were here this morning, we, we kind of landed on this verse towards the end of the message. 2 Peter 1.21. 2 Peter is a little closer to the book of Revelation uh, than Timothy. So if you need help finding it, just kind of keep going towards Revelation there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. This is what Peter says. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Which means that when we see the the prophecy of Isaiah written down, or the prophecy of Malachi, or Zechariah, or Haggai, so on and so forth, those men, they weren't just speaking on their own will alone. They were speaking from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let me read this to you using the word order that it's written in Greek. Just to kind of give you a little bit of the nuance here. It says literally that they were by the Spirit holy being carried, they spoke from God men. Now it sounds really weird in English. But what I'm wanting to show is that it emphasizes they spoke from God. and They were men. There's an emphasis there. The, these people are speaking a word from God. And they, you tie 2 Peter 1 and 2 Timothy 3 together, and you realize that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Yes, through men, but they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, so to speak. One more, uh, Luke 170. This will be our last one. Actually, I lied. We got one more after that. Luke 1, verse 70. Let me tell you what's happening in Luke chapter 1. Zechariah has just heard... Uh, has just had his son John the Baptist born, and so uh, his mouth is open and he can now speak. And so in Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 68, he begins to prophesy. And actually, I'll just begin reading in verse 68, but we're just going to read through verse 70 to, to kind of land. Uh, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. In the house of his servant David, as he spoke, who? The Lord. As the Lord spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. So Zechariah prophesies, and he's saying, Blessed is the Lord God who spoke by the mouth of his prophets from of old. So now there is this interesting scenario where he is basically quoting or referencing prophecies. So I want you just to think with me. I don't know of a better way to put it. Think through the levels of authorship that this one verse demonstrates. And hopefully this comes through clear. So Zechariah is acknowledging that God spoke. Okay, that's one level. He acknowledges that he spoke through the prophets. Then he essentially quotes or refers to much of the statements or words that those prophets said. And Luke is writing it down for us. You see the complexity of their depth. That there's, there's so much to this that this authorship of Scripture is rich. Now one more, 2 Samuel, back into the Old Testament, 2 Samuel. Take your time finding it because it takes me a little while to. I'll tell you a tip while, uh, while we're all looking, looking to find 2 Samuel chapter 23. And while you're finding 2 Samuel uh, 23. I remember several years ago, a guy explained to me how you can remember the order of the books of the Samuels, the Kings, and the Chronicles. First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles. They get less personal. Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. So that's just like extra, y'all. Okay, like that's that's good stuff. I never forgot that. It's like ah, like I never forgot uh, General Electric Power Company. Anybody else heard that? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I remember in college, General Electric Power Company. I've never forgotten that. That was like one of the most valuable things that I've ever heard. So this isn't even on the outline. This is just the Holy Spirit inspired that moment right there. 2 Samuel 23, verse 1 and 2 says this. Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Let me ask you this. Can, can this emphasize any more that a human being is involved? Look at, 
it's the last words of David. That's his name. It's the oracle of David repeats it. He's the son of Jesse. I mean, this is a specific person. It's a man raised on high, anointed of God, the psalmist. This is a person involved. And look what he says. The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. So you've had your pecan pie and you're drinking coffee and your friend asks you, who wrote the Bible? Who wrote it? Is it not awesome? Isn't it good that it's not just a simple answer? Now there is a, there is a clear, quick God inspired the Bible. Absolutely, we hang on to that. We cherish that. And yet, how he did that, by his sovereignty, his plan, his ideas, he, he used people. He used David, like the David who's the son of Jesse, who happened to be musical. And he used Luke, who happened to probably be less musical, if I'm guessing, because he was much more methodical and intentional and all this stuff and, and, and seems sort of book nerdish and all of that. All of these things, who wrote the Bible? God wrote it. He wrote it by inspiring men. And it is, it is God's word. And yet there's this objection that I, I want us to wrestle with. Someone could say, Well, isn't it circular reasoning to say it's God's word because it says it's God's word? I just told you that there's a divine author to this, and how did I back up my claim? I turned to you a few verses in the Bible that said God inspired it, that the Holy Spirit carried men, uh, that David said I was speaking by the Spirit of the Lord. That's essentially saying it's God's word because it says it's God's word, and not everybody's going to buy that explanation, right? Right? Not everyone's going to say, well, fine, you can believe that, but that sounds like circular reasoning. Well, here's what I want us to think through. How do you know that a letter is from somebody? Now, when you receive a handwritten letter, how do you know that the letter is from a particular person? It's signed. It's got a signature. If a letter has a signature that you recognize from someone, then you know it's from that person. It is a signature. We all write in a a particular way. Now, let me just tell you, if you get a letter from me and you can clearly read my name, someone may have forged it because I do not write legibly at all. I know of one human that I can think of that I think writes worse than me, but if, if you see the name Michael Hull written real legibly, I probably did not write it. But if you see my signature, it's going to have a little tilt to it and a little scribble-scrabble to it, and you might pick out the M and the H, and, and sometimes when I write in a bunch of letters, I get nervous and my M gets all squirrely and all that. But my signature has a very distinct look. It's just not real legible. I want you to find 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 real quick. There was an idea that I said to kind of hold on to that Paul, Paul talks about how he signs his letters. So find 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. You guys, man, you guys have been warriors flipping through the pages. In just a moment, you're going to get a break. And a little tease, there may be Snickers involved. Just saying. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. Look at what Paul says. I, Paul, write this greeting. Remember how we looked at another passage where he would said, I'm writing this greeting. I write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. So again, if, if, I'm, if you get a handwritten letter from me and you can clearly read the whole thing, come tell me. Somebody is writing something in my name. Because I write a certain way, Paul wrote a certain way, you write a certain way. He's saying, look, I'm writing this greeting. Maybe someone else wrote it, he dictated it. I'm writing this greeting with my own hand. It's like if I send out a form letter. I want to make sure people can read it. I type it out, but then I'll sign copies of it. This is my signature. This is what Paul's doing. I'm writing this with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way 
I write. We know that a letter is from someone by their signature. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 1 with me. Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, we again get our eyes open to the, the reality of God's word, God's revelation. This is one of the more breathtaking uh, introductions to a book of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. That's just reiterating everything we just looked at. God spoke to people by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, Jesus, the Son, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. God has already given us his signature. It's Jesus Christ. So so there's this word here where it says he's the exact imprint. This word in Greek is character. As I was just looking at this text a couple weeks ago, look, it's the word character. Like Jesus is the character of God. He's the exact imprint. The idea behind this word is like this book stamp. Uh, this is my book stamp. By the way, for those of, you, those of you who really love books, this is the way to go. So when I get a book, I can put a stamp in the front page. And it says, actually it's hard to read it, like the library, from the library of Michael David Hall or something like that. Well, this stamp is designed where when you clutch down on it, it puts a, a stamp into the paper. That paper now reflects the exact imprint of the stamp. Now, every analogy can fall apart, but just kind of let that be a helpful analogy that Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God. Like, he is God. When we see Jesus, we're seeing God's signature. Now, let's go one more step. Go to John chapter 1. So, Jesus is God's signature. In John chapter 1, verse 1, as we just started looking at the beginning of our Christmas series, I'm here in the book of Jonah. I better get to the book of John. In the book of John, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now I'll go to verse 14. The Word became flesh. That is the signature of God taking on flesh. This is God's very Word. Like, this is the ultimate letter signed and delivered when God sent his son into the world. So this this is not circular reasoning when we say God's word is God's word because it says so. No, no. God's word is God's word because Jesus is the signature and word of God. It's not circular reasoning. It's theological truth. And so we go to John chapter 14. Just stay in the book of John. Go to chapter 14. I want you to see verses 25 and 26. And then we're going to take a breath. We're going to take a break here in a moment. Not a break, but just we're going to take a breath. John 14, verse 25 and 26. So I want you to see that God sent his word, who was with God in the beginning, the eternal word. God sent the word as flesh, incarnated Jesus Christ. The Christ, and on top of that, Jesus in chapter 14 is getting his followers ready for him to be gone. What does he say? He says in chapter 14, verse 25, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. The word of God is saying things to his followers. He says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. And so Jesus' promise is fulfilled, as we recall 2 Peter 1, 21, because men carried along by the Holy Spirit 
wrote down God's Word. So it is not circular reasoning to say that the Bible is God's Word because it says it's God's Word. The Bible is God's Word because God has revealed Himself ultimately through Jesus Christ, the Word of God, whose very Spirit, after He ascended, inspired, breathed out, and has completed what we have in the Bible. So who wrote the Bible? God wrote it. Men wrote it. It is God's word written by human authors. And so now here's some discussion. I want, I want you guys to just take a moment and think of a couple questions while you're thinking we're going to do a giveaway. And I do want you to think about it, and I want to hear maybe a couple responses here. Got, got just a couple places where I want to hear some of your thoughts. So my first question is, why does it matter that the Bible has a divine author who used human authors? Just think about that question. Why does it matter that the Bible has a divine author who used human authors? Maybe take a moment and write some thoughts down uh, while you're thinking about it. Why does it matter that the Bible has a divine author who used human authors? And how does the dual authorship, okay, that's a, that's a phrase that we'll use. How does the dual authorship of God's Word inform how we read it? and inform how we apply it. So I want you to be thinking about that. Let's do another giveaway. Debbie, you ready for some more giveaways? Did everybody put their name in a bowl? All right, did anybody put their name more than once in a bowl? You can come forward and repent. So, so just as a reminder, I want you to be thinking about why it matters. Why does it matter? The Bible has a divine author who used human authors, and how does the dual authorship of God's Word inform how we read it and apply it. All right, so while you're writing and thinking, let's do a giveaway. Which color is which again? Yellow? All right, I'm mixing it up, BJ. Nice and mixed. All right, Pam Tootin, come on down. I saw you over here. Come on down, Pam. Everybody give her a round of applause. She is getting... A copy of the Gospel-Centered Teachings, Showing Christ and all the Scripture. Let me say this, I, and maybe this goes without saying, but I do want you all to hear this from me. Uh, read books, thank you, read books critically. Like, you don't have to agree with everything written in it. I'm not saying that because I disagree. I think it's a great book, very helpful. It just needs to be said. I don't necessarily agree with every line written in there, and even if I disagreed, I wouldn't necessarily tell the authors. They probably have a reason uh, for what they wrote. But use these as resources, as tools. And let's see here. One of our teachers, Cade Strickland. Is he still in here? Oh, man. Well, tell him he missed out. He can come back next week and try again. But we appreciate his ministry. Kaylee Huntsinger, is she in here? Yes, come on down. Give her a round of applause, everybody. Now, this book is the companion volume to what Roland got by Gordon Fee, Doug the Stewart, called How to Read the Bible Book by Book. So this is kind of like a reference work where you can, if you're studying Genesis or Psalms, so on and so forth, you all have it? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. That is fantastic. One of the reasons that I'm actually telling you about these books is if you're interested in buying some, uh, go ahead and get them. You know, if you, don't win the, if you don't win the giveaway, you can get these. I buy tons of books, so they're always there, ready to go. All right, so uh, I would love to hear some thoughts, and you get rewarded for bravery. Why does it matter that the Bible has a divine author who used human authors? Now, let me go, before I hear any answers, let me just tell you, I do not have an answer typed out. I don't have an answer prepared to go. I just want us to think about this. There, there's like a billion things we could probably say. I just want to hear some fresh thoughts. So don't be like, oh gosh, I wonder what he's... There's not necessarily one thing I'm waiting to hear. But, but why does it matter? My first, all right, first thing I saw, Alan, yep. Absolutely. Let me try to summarize. That's fantastic. So a dual authorship of Scripture, you have God giving his thoughts, which Alan said are way beyond our thoughts, using human authors so that the vessels that he uses can communicate clearly to us 
uh, so that we can hear his word. Fantastic. I am going to toss this. All right, like I said, oh, that's my fault. That's my fault. And let me just tell y'all, just so you know, when I preached at Rush several uh, months ago, I passed out Snickers, but I was like passing out like bite-sized ones. I mean, this is like the full size deal right here. So he, he was our first brave, brave answer. Let me ask this question. Uh, how does the dual authorship of God's word inform how you read it or apply it? Any thoughts on that? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me let me just summarize fantastic for those who may not be able to hear that God using his word that he wrote and inspired through human people who were all sinners just like you and me shows that he can have the kind of relationship with us that is intimate, uh, that is growing, and he uses his word to do that as we read it. You also talked about how we read, when we read Scripture, it's a Holy Spirit moment, right? It, it, we believe that the Holy Spirit that inspired the Word of God also is continually illuminating that word for us as we read it, or Lord willing, as it's preached or discussed in Bible studies. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Rick. All right, now, I got... My baseball career was, was, was years ago, so I'm not as accurate maybe as I should be. I've got four more Snickers, but we're going to just have to hold off, all right? So for those of you who are hangry, I'm sorry, we're just going to have to keep going. Uh, we'll pass out some more in a moment. That, that really is the first of three parts tonight. I think maybe it's the one that's going to take the longest as a reminder. If you need to go, go ahead and go. Uh, we are not going to be real strict on, you know, staying or whatever. So just do what you got to do. I want to talk now. Our second main part is I want to talk about the attributes of God's Word. We've talked about the authors of God's Word. Now I want us to talk about the attributes of God's Word. Now what we're going to do is we're going to, again, flip to several verses, not quite as many but we're going to let these scripture passages tell us what the attributes of God's word are, okay? So, so first, let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Let's go ahead and take a moment, find 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Just as a reminder, Paul is giving words of instruction to a young pastor. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start reading in verse 14, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings of which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, there are, there are two attributes that I want us to pull from verse 15. Number one, these are sacred. The Word of God is sacred. These are sacred writings. And they are able to make wise for salvation. They are able to make wise for salvation. So I want to just sort of sit down this thought for a moment and tell you just a story that, that I experienced. I'll keep it vague. Uh, several years ago, um, I found myself in a conversation with about seven church leaders of a particular church. And in this, in this conversation, it was actually a very tense conversation. And um, they were very displeased with some things as far as how we were approaching preaching the scriptures and all this. And, and, uh, and I was being told how I was doing it wrong, and you shouldn't be doing it this way, and, and you shouldn't do that. And, and if you keep doing what you're going to do, and there's gonna be, you're going to be preaching to four empty walls and all this. It's just very discouraging. And we kind of went back and forth, and finally I, I'd had enough. And I finally just said, look. I said, Deb, why don't we each go one at a time? Why don't you tell me about your time in the Word lately? Because uh, I'd had it. I'll, I'll be honest, I'd had it. 
and we had gone over. I was, be, I was being uh, ridiculed for we were reading, like having scripture readings in, in the Sunday morning service, just time where we'd read a section of scripture, and some people didn't like that. And so I said, why don't we, why don't we go to the room? I want you to tell me about your time in God's Word. I mean, if you're going to be telling me that I'm not doing the ministry of the Word correctly, then let's at least talk about what your experience with the Word is. And so I started to my left, and, and, and to, to this man's credit, he was honest. He said, honestly, I haven't spent much time in it. And so I went to the next person, and they hadn't spent much time in it. And went around the circle. I got to, I think, the second to the last person. And, and this man over here to my right, he's the only one that could even describe the semblance of what we might call a devotional or a quiet time. And these were leaders, like the top leading board of the church. And only one of them could describe having any interaction with the Word that looked anything like a quiet time, devotional, Bible reading, prayer, whatever you want to call it. And he's the one that said, but I don't think that just reading Scripture is going to help anybody come to salvation. And I, I left that meeting so discouraged, so deflated. I want you to know that when I say that the Bible is sacred and able to make wise for salvation, that's not my opinion. It's not my idea. It's what is said, and I believe it. I believe that the mere reading of Scripture can be powerful enough to bring someone to salvation because this is God's Word. This is God's revelation. This is what He has to say to us. And so that can be used. Hold on just a minute. Hold, is it a question? You have a question? Okay, just, just hang tight just a moment and because we're going to have some discussion here a little bit. might be a better time for him to do that. So I firmly believe that the reading of Scripture as sacred writings breathed out by God is able to make someone wise for salvation. It is the tool used to open eyes. Now, I'm not saying every worship service should simply be Bible reading. Obviously, we don't do that here. We do more, right? There's more that God has designed. But I want you to know that I really do believe that the Bible is sacred, that it is powerful, that it has new life power. It has resurrection power, salvation power in it. Why? Because God spoke it. Because the human authors were carried by the Holy Spirit. By the way, they didn't let go of their personalities. I mean, no, they have all their personalities. It's just this powerful, miraculous moment, and it makes these writings sacred and able to make wise for salvation. Now, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Just so uh, if you're in 2 Timothy, flip forward a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. Again, we are just kind of looking for attributes of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, look at what Peter says. He says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the Word, and this Word is the good news that was preached to you. So the attribute is, uh, it is living, it is enduring. It is living and it is enduring. The word of the Lord remains forever. This word is the good news that was preached to you. Now, did you notice that Peter's quoting? Y'all see the quotation marks there? So let's go ahead and maybe hunt this down. Flip to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. Actually, I'll start reading in verse 6. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6 through 8. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? This is going to sound familiar. All flesh is grass. All its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever we 
we have a, a word that is living and it is enduring. It is eternal. It will live forever. It will stand forever. It does not fade. It does not wither. You and I do, but not God's word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Find the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. This is an interesting passage because this is one of those verses uh, that I think is very well known, uh, or at least when, when we hear it, we, we kind of know it. We, we almost have it memorized because you've heard it so many times. But then, then if you really think about it, it's, you know, you've got to think, man, do I, do I, re- do I really like <laughs> what it's saying? Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active Okay, so on, uh, so far, so good. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay, that sounds really cool, right? I, I like swords. Sharper than a sword. But look at what he says. Piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the attributes here are it's living, it's active, it's sharp, it's piercing, it is discerning. Now this is, this is this, a verse that at the same time is so inspiring and encouraging and it is so challenging and convicting. We have in our hands and in our laps a word written by God inspiring human authors, and one of its attributes is how sharp it is to pierce us, to discern us. I I don't know that it gets more uh, intricate or intimate as far as division goes between joints and marrow. Like that's about as internal as you can get. I cut my finger the other night just on the very surface. Just, I mean, just barely, just nicked it just enough to draw a little blood, and that got my attention. But if you, if you start cutting to the division of joints and marrow, you're going deep. And this is an attribute of God's Word. It is the division of soul and spirit. Somehow those are divided and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's where it's hard. Because I will speak for myself that my thoughts and my intentions, intentions are not always pure, are not always good, by a long shot. But this is an attribute of God's Word, and we have to cherish it. We have to marvel it. Let's go to Psalm 19. Kind of wrap up this little section here. Psalm 19. If you're not familiar with Psalm 19, it is, it is a really good one. I also, of course, I recommend them all, but... Uh, Psalm 19, Psalm 119 are some of these fascinating passages about the Word of God. If we wanted to be here a really long time, we could just walk through Psalm 119, but y'all may not come back next week if we did that tonight. Psalm 19. Let's read verses uh, 7 through 11. Actually, you know what? Let's begin in verse 1. In verses 1 through 6, I want you to hear terms that deal with the idea of a word. Spoken word, whatever. The heavens declare. So that's what I mean. Like the word declares. Obviously a word is being spoken. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So that's just all kind of to get us going. Now verse 7, I really want us to soak these in. Here we see all these attributes of God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is perfect. Sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. He's not being facetious. We should value God's word more than treasure, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. So the psalmist, in this case, it's David, we're told there, the Psalm of David, gives all these names to the Word of God, the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandment, the fear, the rules, and all of these descriptions, these attributes, perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true. That is like a profound list of attributes. But notice, he also gives us descriptions of its use to revive the soul and make wise the simple and to rejoice the heart and enlighten the eyes It endures forever. It gives you something that you would desire even more than gold. These are descriptions of its use. And that's what we're going to get to in the very last part of tonight's lecture is really the the use of Scripture. So before we get there, we're going to have some discussions. So Cheryl, I want to hear uh, what you had to share in just a moment. Let me go ahead and just kind of revisit our general question here. How do the attributes of God's Word inform how we read it and apply it and Cheryl you got a Snickers coming your way and I can try to get it to you from here like there's a restaurant that throws rolls I could try that but but for right now ponder it but we're going to come to you first okay but I want you guys to ponder the idea how do these attributes sacred able to make wise for salvation living enduring active sharp piercing, discerning, and all these descriptions in Psalm 19. How do these attributes of God's Word inform how we read it and apply it? If you want to, go ahead and write some thoughts down so you don't forget it. We're going to do another giveaway. So let's see here. We're going to, we're going to mix up our yellow bowl. And our Pat Ayers. Is Pat? There you are. I'll come to you with it. Give Miss Pat a round of applause, everybody. You've got a brand new copy of Gospel Center Teaching. I didn't even stamp that one with my book stamp. By the way, if y'all want to come up and look at my book stamp later, you can. This thing is awesome. All right, one more teacher here. We have Kim Mitchell, everybody. I don't know Kim. Do y'all know Kim? Let me tell you what Kim does. Kim preaches to our kids, so we're going to put our arm around her. She teaches these kids, and you know what they're doing? They're hearing the gospel. We have a book here. This is called From Chaos to Cosmos. Subtitle is Creation to New Creation. Let me tell you what this is. This guy, it's by a guy named Sidney Gradanus, okay? Now, for what it's worth, Sidney Gradanus is like in my research. Like I'm using a lot of his stuff for my dissertation. And so he's a biblical theologian. He's written a book that basically studies the idea of creation all through the Bible and how it goes from chaos to cosmos, how God is recreating the world. So it's, it's a cool little study there. So thank you very much. Y'all give Miss Kim a round of applause. And I also, I want to say this. I love seeing that our children's teachers are here. There's not a more fertile ministry. Okay, God is doing powerful things. Uh, that is the most evangelistically fruitful ministry. When you're teaching kids, uh, they believe everything you say. So don't you dare tell them about the tigers, okay? You just leave that to yourself. So. Okay, so our question is basically, how do the attributes of God's Word inform how we read it and apply it? And Cheryl, I want you to go ahead and share uh, what you had just a few minutes ago, if you don't mind. That's fine. Go ahead. I, I know I stalled you. Well, you gotta, you gotta get your name pulled out. Rules are rules. Right.
Right, and I wouldn't disagree with that. What I would actually say is it, it's really both and. Because what you just talked about as far as a Christian reading the Word and growing is actually what we're about to talk about in a few moments. But what I would argue on top of that is that the Word of God, the Scriptures, the writings are powerful because they're inspired by God. So that, do what? Yes, absolutely anything can. And so someone can pick up a copy of God's Word not knowing Jesus and can read it and can come to know Jesus. Absolutely. Now, I'm not saying that's the only way it happens. It's probably not the most prolific way it happens, but I believe it can happen, and I believe it does happen. Why? Because the writings, the scriptures, are sacred, inspired by God, and they are able to make wise for salvation. So an unsaved person can just take, let's just say they, they came across this particular Bible on my desk and took it home and started reading it and no one else is in there and they don't have their favorite television preacher. I believe they can read the Bible and the Holy Spirit absolutely can use this word to make them wise for salvation. Absolutely. Uh, now, what I would also say on top of that, and I, and I think everyone would probably resonate with this, by no means does that say that we just kind of leave it at that. No, we're actually called to preach it. In Romans 10, Paul goes on to say, but say how, how is anyone going to come to salvation if they don't hear the Word? It's, it's the Word by which they're saved. And how are they going to hear it unless someone preaches to them? So, so obviously the, the, the power and value of sharing the gospel, whether that's preaching to a group or one-on-one -on -one evangelism, or whatever, uh, is obviously more than crucial uh, but I believe by the inherent attribute of Scripture, there is power in God's Word to make someone wise to salvation. Yeah. Right, yeah, someone else said that, the Gideon's movement, yeah. They, absolutely. Yeah, it would be, it would be powerful, and, and in heaven, I guess, we'll be able to figure this out. It's how many people have come to Christ by coming across a copy of, and whether it's the whole Bible, or you think of cultures where they don't even have a whole Bible. I hear of cultures where they just, they, they scrap and claw to get a page of Scripture and just soak it in. I wonder how many people really have had their eyes open to the gospel and have received Christ. I had a teacher in college who found himself in jail uh, back in the day when he was young, and he tells a story. I guess he was given like a, almost like a Gideon's copy of the New Testament. He just started reading it. He said he just devoured it. Read it in a week and while he was in jail, and it was like the Lord just opened his eyes. Yet yeah, one more thought. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. How about one more thought, really, just on how the, the, the attributes of God's Word affect how we read it and apply it? Yeah. Say that one more time. Praise the Lord. Can you, can you kind of summarize or how did you come across it? Right. Very cool. Praise the Lord. Listening to the book of John. Was it a cassette tape? Yes. If God can use a cassette tape to bring someone to salvation, that's a powerful word. Praise the Lord. That, that is, that's the word we're talking about. That's why we're spending time on a Sunday afternoon while I know football's on, although the NFL's not as important as college football, but, but this is why we're here looking at it, because it has that kind of power, these kinds of riches, because 
it's not exaggerating when it says that we should desire it more than gold. It's not exaggerating when it says it divides to the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is powerful stuff, and it's, it's because God breathed it out. It's because the Holy Spirit inspired it. Now, what I want to do is I want to finish up by talking about the applications of God's Word. In other words, how, how should we use it? What, not, not really how we should use it. I need to rephrase that. This is not how we use the Bible. This is how God uses His Word. You all see the distinction there? Okay, how does God use His Word? What are the applications of God's Word? First, I would imagine many can already guess. I believe you have a blank here. It's creation. The Word of God was originally used, or at least when we first come across the idea of the Word of God, it is used for nothing other than creation. So just for just, well, let me, let me read. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. Verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. God said this. God said that. He called it good. It is the Word of God creating. In John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things came into being through Him. There wasn't one thing that was made that didn't come through the Word of God. The Word of God is used by God to create. Now, I was getting ahead of myself for a second. Now, let's just stop, take a step back. Creation pretty much sums it up, right? In the beginning, God created the what? The heavens and the earth. That, that's basically like everything. Everything. God's Word is used to create everything. Like there's nothing that exists, there's nothing that happens that is independent of the Word of God. Nothing. Because even, even God Himself, He's this eternally existing Word as the second person of the Trinity. He is God the Word. Like the Word is everything. God uses His Word for creation. God uses His Word for salvation. We've discussed 2 Timothy 3.15 uh, a couple times and, and just now had a discussion about it. It is used, God uses His Word for salvation. Read, uh, maybe make a note and read Romans 10 and kind of let that inspire you a little bit. How are they going to believe if they don't hear? They need to hear the Word of Christ. How are they going to hear if they don't have preachers, and how are they going to preach if they're not sent, and so on and so forth. God uses His Word to create, to save. Creation, salvation, and finally, sanctification. Now here, I do want to go to 2 Timothy 3 again. We're going to look at verse 16 and 17. So creation, salvation, and sanctification. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Now, we read that part, and we stopped there. We keep reading now, though. And profitable, or useful, or applicable, same type concept, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So there are now four uses that Paul lays out. Teaching, Reproof, correction, training in righteousness. But then he goes on and he really gives us the foundation. That, or so that, the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This word that was used for creation, that's used for salvation, is used for our sanctification, which is what you were saying, Cheryl, is that a saved person reads Scripture and the Holy Spirit uses His Word to bring us along in our faith, and it is for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training in righteousness, with the goal of completion. That's that's idea of sanctification is this word of being made holy, becoming more in our holiness. It's this idea of God bringing us along in our faith to be sanctified, equipped for every good work. So God uses His Word to make us useful. 
God uses His Word in our lives because He wants, us, he wants to use us. He wants to use us to do ministry and to, to proclaim His kingdom. So God's Word is applied through creation, salvation, sanctification, and then one more, and this is where we're going to land tonight. It is for revelation. So I want you to turn to the book of Revelation, to the very last chapter, chapter 22. The applications of God's Word are creation, salvation, sanctification, revelation. I'm not saying there are no other words that we could put in this list. I'm just saying these, these are the four that really came to my mind. And I want us to think about how this word revelation shows us the nature of Scripture Revelation 22, verse 6. Now we're, we're about to read how the Bible ends right here. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. Now I highlighted the phrase, these words. Okay, we're talking about words, logoi. In the beginning was the word, the logos. Here's the word logoi. These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. We are dealing with a book that has words in it of a certain nature, prophecy. And no prophet spoke on his own will, but he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. You see how powerful this is? Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets. And those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood i jesus have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches i am the root and the descendant of david the bright morning star the spirit and the bride say come let the one who hears say come and let the one who is thirsty come let the one who desires take the water of life without price i warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book by the way do y'all know what the word book in greek is Biblos. The word Bible just means book. Blessed, whoever hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. And that is how the Bible ends. I got to be honest, I, I have read Revelation multiple times. I remember, uh, just like King Lemuel, maybe with his mom, I remember lay, laying on bed at night, uh, on the bed at night, while my mom read to me from the book of Revelation, the description of the new heavens, the new earth, and all this stuff. But it has never occurred to me until recently how much the emphasis is on the words of the prophecy of this book. God uses his word to reveal to reveal himself, to reveal his plan, what he's about, to reveal what he's going to do. Does he show us everything? Absolutely not. We cannot comprehend God's fullness. We cannot understand his complete plan, and we sure cannot understand every detail of eternity moving forward. But he is revealing to us, he is showing to us by his word, by this book. Now, I just want you to think, how 
do these applications of God's word inform how we read it and apply it? If God uses his word for creation, salvation, sanctification, and revelation, then how does that inform the way you're going to read it tomorrow and the next day and the next day? How does it inform how you're going to apply it? I want you to take a moment, think about that, write some thoughts down. We're going to have our final giveaway of the night. So we'll pull one of our yellow cards here. Susan Johnson, I saw you right in the middle, right? All right, everybody give Susan a round of applause. You are the proud new owner of Gospel Centered Teaching by Trevin Wax, showing Christ and all the scripture. Now this morning I hinted that it might be new cars and paid off mortgages that you'd be getting tonight, but I trust y'all are more satisfied with these books. And our final giveaway for the night, so just to be clear, if you come back next week, we're going to be doing giveaways each night. I'm so excited about Carol Smith. She just left. Oh, the heartbreak. The heartbreak. Yeah. Bring on Brandon Pelfrey, everybody. All right, Brandon. Let me tell you about this book here. You're going to like this. Brandon's a book guy. This is the Concise Bible Commentary edited by David Dockery. David Dockery is the president of of uh, my college and so that's a very helpful kind of a one volume commentary i still use my copy of it quite frequently do you have it? I don't know. excellent i've been actually looking for a commentary to, to dig on the lord will provide right yeah, there absolutely. give him a hand everybody all right if god uses his word to create and save and sanctify and reveal mostly himself, then how does that inform how you're going to go about reading it? Yeah, Michelle. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So let me just summarize this for those so everyone can hear, and also it helps for the recording. She, she says, basically, when we know that God's Word is this powerful, especially the ideas of it sanctifying and revealing Himself to us, there is an anticipation, there is an excitement that when we go to Him in His Word, that He's going to do stuff in His life. He's going to, to show Himself, to show us things. Uh, that's a fantastic, fantastic thought. Thank you very much, Michelle. Something else, Brandon? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. That is, that's snicker worthy right there, sir. That's fantastic. Let me summarize what he says. He keyed in on the idea of relationship, which while you were talking, we're going to give you credit. It, that's a great word to kind of summarize these applications. Think about this. God created us. He uses his word to create. We are created by his word. God saves us. He brings us into relationship. He brings us into being. He brings us into relationship through his word. He sanctifies us. He grooms our relationship. He is at work in our life, and he is consistently and will eternally be showing himself to us, revealing us. That, that is what relationship is all about. 
uh, which is why you get excited about going to it, Michelle. And so that really is the perfect thought to kind of end on, is that we have a God who's given us a word for relationship. And it is, it's powerful. It's not just to make us feel good. It's not just so that we don't feel lonely. It's because the God who created everything and created you wants you to know him. And he wants you to know him more and more and more. And here's one, one, one final thought, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Yeah, Brian? Right. Right. Yep. It'll, it, it will get them going in the right direction for sure. Absolutely. What did you say? What was the first? Right. Okay. Yep. Yep. Good word. Good word. Thank you. Let me go ahead and wrap it up here, and, and I know we can have some conversations before. Let me let me say this, then I want to uh, close us in prayer. Here's the cool thing: like we're not even scratching the surface. Y'all realize that, right? Not even scratching the surface. And yet I feel that we've had a rich time in Scripture. We've been bouncing back and forth, but, but if anything, walk away in awe of the depth of God's Word and in awe of the fact that, that that's the kind of depth He wants you to have in relationship with Him. And let's, let's seek Him in His Word so that we are equipped for every good work so that we are growing in our relationship with him and then he is also using us uh, to show himself to others so here's what i want to do i want to go ahead and say a prayer and dismiss us obviously we can mill about and have conversations for a little while but i want to thank you guys for coming i hope you found this time worthwhile i enjoyed it this is just my kind of thing so i had a lot of fun doing this i hope you enjoyed it uh, thank you so much for coming. I hope to see as uh, many of you as I can next week. We will be talking about interpreting the Bible. We're going to talk a little bit more about reading to understand accurately and correctly, uh, and that'll just get us going in more conversations. So let's pray and thank God for our time tonight. Lord, I do thank you for just giving us tonight as an opportunity uh, to savor your word. Lord, we... We celebrate that you are the ultimate author. You are the divine author of your word. And you are sovereign and creative enough to use people as instruments, as vessels, as conduits of your word, as authors. And we celebrate the fact that the attributes of your word are, are overwhelming, that your word is living. These, these documents, centuries old, are living and active. Lord, forgive us if we ever think the Bible is irrelevant. It's the most relevant, living and active and enduring. And Lord, we praise you that you use your word to create and to save and to sanctify and to reveal yourself. And Lord, we're reminded in closing that you will forever be revealing yourself to us. You will forever be growing us in our relationship with you. And we will know what it's like to spend eternity with the very word of God in your presence. We thank you for that. Lord, please, please pour your blessing according to your word on this church family. Please grow us in our understanding of your word, in our interpretation of your word, in our obedience to your word. Grow us in the way we are equipped to then share your word. Please, Lord, do powerful things for your glory through these people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Feel free to come and look at some of these books if you want to take pictures and, and maybe look for them yourself.